All right, friends, we're back at it. And today we will be discussing professional sports. And as you can see, um, when we think of professional sports within the United States, we generally think about Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, National Hockey League, and the National Football League. But uh, as we'll see in the next slide, a couple of slides and throughout this presentation, uh, the field or, or sector of professional sports within the sport management field is much more diverse and much more nuanced than just these big three. So you should have that in mind as we start to discuss this general area and the uh, various issues that make up professional sport within the United States. So professional sports are classified as any sort of area where you have athletes who are competing either individually or on a team uh, and they're trying to perform for pay. So play to pay in an either an individual or team standpoint. And this really, this area has been uh, inflated from the influx of corporate money that's come into professional sport over the last 20 to 30 to 40 years as sports has become more globalized and markets have sought to enter the United States to capitalize on this market and vice versa. And so we have billions of dollars entering into professional sport and they're driv derived through either media rights or gate receipts, uh, different seating options, sponsorships, uh, branding, uh, et cetera. And we've got, the f we've got uh, five uh, professional sports leagues here in North America, including Major League Soccer, uh, but then we also have a slew of emerging sports, and we're not even talking about eSport, which is just on the horizon, electronic sport. The, uh, the um, principles that are most um, readily applicable to professional sport uh, are labor relations, management issues, and government principles, which we'll talk about uh, shortly uh, and throughout this, this um, presentation. As I said, although we usually think of Major League Baseball, National Football League, the National Basketball Association, and the National Hockey League, uh, it's much more diverse. We've got, as I said, Major League Soccer, we've got lacrosse, we've got uh, combat sports, we've got bull riding, we've got golf, we've got tennis, we've got uh, motors, uh, motor sports, uh, and you even have things like rugby, uh, Australian rules football, um, roller hockey, it really runs the gambit. So the field of professional sport is not just confined to uh, traditional areas. And so as we go through this, uh, it will be very helpful to keep that in mind as you think about career opportunities uh, in sport management um, and other opportunities, generally speaking. But for professional sports, um, we've got uh, MLB, NFL, NHL, NBA, and MLS. And combined, there's about 141 teams at the major league level, plenty of opportunities. But if you're also looking for um, more um, adventurous opportunities or startups or area uh, uh, teams and leagues with less competition, you could look to things like the um, National Lacrosse League, the WNBA, uh, or different startup leagues. Uh, in addition, North American sports um, have uh, many, many minor league teams in the various sports, um, so there's a great amount of opportunities. There's also professional leagues, uh, not just domestically, but across the world uh, on every continent. So there are certainly great amounts of opportunities. And we're not even talking about individual sports, such as tennis, golf, NASCAR. Um, so the, the opportunities for sport managers to uh, seek out and obtain experience are, are pretty vast. Now, if we're talking about the quote unquote big four, which is uh, baseball, football, basketball, and hockey within the United States, each of them have different uh, histories, um, but they're also sort of um, bonded by um, initial difficulties and labor strife throughout their initial existence. So Major League Baseball started really with the Cincinnati Red Stockings in 1869, becoming the first professional uh, sports team and they, uh, in addition to barnstorming, uh, would play any sort of uh, other team, whether it's amateur or professional, 
uh, for uh, in the contest. And as the textbook mentions, the Reds were handsomely compensated. Um, the uh, there was no league really competing uh, or for against the Red Stockings until about 1915, and the NFL started in 1920. Uh, it's one of the significant events that happened was a merger between the National Football League and the um, and its uh, competitor, the upstart American Football League, and they merged. Uh, but there was other competitors that were less successful, like the USFL, the WFL, the World Football League, and then uh, the XFL, which was Vince McMahon's investment with NBC uh, to have a, a rival league. The National Basketball Association was created in 1949, and uh, it merged uh, partially with the ABA in, in 1976. NHL was started in 1917 and expanded into the United States in 1924. Uh, several times the NBA, or sorry, the NHL almost folded due to different issues, world events, uh, World War II, uh, World War I. This led to uh, much of the talent being called away uh, and also revenues being drained, which put the financial health of the NHL in serious jeopardy. And then also kind of extraordinarily speaking, uh, there was uh, a, I believe it was a flu or some sort of um, sickness epidemic that almost wiped out the NHL because there was not enough uh, talent. And so uh, after weathering these these uh, different emergencies and issues, the NHL um, strengthened in the uh, later parts of the 20th century. And it also was able to fight off a um an attempt by the World Hockey Association to steal away a, a much of the NHL's talent. Uh, ultimately, the WHA and the NHL merged. So um, each of these sorts of leagues had their struggles, but ultimately uh, developed into the team that they uh, were today. So as I mentioned, um, in 1869, the first professional team in sports was the Red Stockings. Uh, their total payroll uh, was about nine, a little under ten thousand dollars, which I think uh, was about you know ten times or so the average salary of uh, the average American. So um, this again uh, is on par with where we place sports today, uh, where uh, the uh, people with extraordinary skills are compensated to that uh, very handsomely. The uh, first uh, professional sport league. Uh, emerged in the about uh, seven years later, and as part of the uh, first American Sport League, the National League, there was limit. There was uh, bylaws which uh, were created to establish um, rules that all teams needed to follow and abide by. There was limits on franchise movement because uh, in the past um, teams would. Uh, would be created and fold in the same year, or they would be created and move in the, in the, in the, in the same year to get better deals and to um, um, get higher pay for their players and the owners. And so uh, the National League said, no, we're going to put an end to this because teams coming and going from the league uh, and teams moving, this creates instability, and we need a stable league with stable clubs. Um, and also allowed for territorial rights and, and zones of exclusivity, which survive today, and also mechanisms for expulsions of clubs who refuse to abide by bylaws. We also see the introduction of the reserve clause, which um, meant that teams were able to um, own the services of players in perpetuity, which meant that a, a player could only negotiate with one club, which drove down the... Uh, price of that player, which drove down salaries in general. So um, leagues, we ended up seeing through what's called corporate governance, mo the model of corporate governance, that leagues would organize themselves into systems where they govern by themselves as opposed to some sort of corporate structure where there might have been a board of directors uh, or external actors that would oversee the leagues. But really, um, today, we see this corporate governance model still be in existence that's overseen by a commissioner who acts within the best interest of the league and has different powers. So leagues are structured uh, today under this umbrella organization where the league is, is at the top and then franchises are below and they operate in a manner where although they're competitors on the field, 
they'll cooperate with each other in business transactions uh, so that they're able to grow revenues of that sport or of that league. And everyone, uh, each member of that league is able to um, profit handsomely. So although the uh, Dallas Cowboys and New York Giants are bitter competitors on the field of play, they're also equal partners in the financial good health of the, uh, the National Football League. Um, however, when you have teams that are per, engage, that are um, that are present in the same industry, like the Giants and the uh, Cowboys, they both are professional football teams. They both compete for fans and, and ticket sales and players. Um, but when they act in a way that they're colluding or cooperating for things like setting ticket prices or uh, signing, um, uh, pooling their rights to allow that those those um, the rights to broadcast games to be pooled and sold to the highest bidder, that's actually collusion, which is against antitrust law, which we'll talk about. And antitrust law is uh, prohibited under federal law. So, um, you know, effort to try to avoid this, the appearance that competitors are colluding. Some sport leagues over the last uh, 20 years were uh, uh, organized as what are called single entities, uh, like Major League Soccer and the WNBA were both initially organized as single entities, meaning that the league office itself owns each of the individual franchises and investors who are investing in the league will then be designated as operators of different teams. Of course, it's a little bit different for professional uh, football or basketball because the uh, owner, uh, Jerry Jones, is not uh, is not an investor or owner within the National Football League. He's an owner investor of the Cowboys. So it's a little bit different. And this um, the uh, single entity structure was challenged in court, but ultimately it was found not to be violating antitrust rules because of this uh, single entity uh, um, status. Uh, which is beneficial for sports leagues. And we'll talk about this a little bit later. In terms of ownership, um, franchise ownerships, uh, ownership was initially thought to be a hobby for those who were wealthy. And it was sort of um, owners would, uh, would operate a professional sports team because they did it because they loved the game. And they did it not to make money, but they did it because it was more of public service. Now, it was these uh, operating a team uh, back when, back in the uh, early 20th century uh, or 18th or 19th century was looked at as operating from a mom and pop business where they were they didn't really know what they're doing it wasn't professionalized but now today um, owning a professional sports team actually looks like a business investment we look at the values of professional sports teams and the billions of dollars. And it's seen as something where your interest can appreciate over time and revenues can be generated. So it's no longer a hobby. So if we look at um, the uh, the graph here, we look at um, from Business Insider in 2015, the total valuation of all of the teams in the NFL was more, way above uh, um, $50 billion total. So 62.90, almost $63 billion. You look at uh, the NHL, and they're lagging behind at uh, much, much, much less than that. So these valuations can vary, but um, uh, it speaks to the uh, value and increase in, in valuation of these teams. So because these, these dollars, uh, the amount of money that... Um, that these franchises are worth, uh, we're seeing the professionalization of many of these leagues and people of high net worth and, and also other uh, uh, corporate structures um, are coming in for an ownership, ownership interest. Now, there is an exception where um, all in the NFL, only family or individuals uh, ownership is, is allowed because of um, the rules. Now, uh, the NFL has sort of relaxed some of its restrictions on um, who can own an NFL team. But for the most part, um, all professional sports leagues are looking at high net worth individuals. 
So because of the cost and value of these teams, owners are trying to regain a lot of the cost of their purchase by gr by growing revenues. Um, and we see it to varying degrees um, that um, leagues like na the National uh, or like Major League Baseball really focus on individual uh, rights for team owners, whereas uh, the NFL looks to try to uh, maximize revenues for the uh, entire league equally. So some owners can control local markets um, or in, in based on their league, and some owners are not allowed to do that. So like I said, in the National Football League, uh, they have a policy where um, they try to uh, have it so the uh, teams will um, assign their rights in the teams or in their intellectual property and different rights to the league. And then the league will negotiate all of those rights uh, for different sponsors and broadcast networks. And then each of the franchises will get an equal share of whatever revenues is generated. So for example, uh, NFL has NFL properties, which is the uh, holder of the intellectual property of all of the teams and then nfl properties uh, negotiates agreements with different companies for endorsements and sponsorship agreements and nfl properties pays each team i think i believe there's 32 teams in the and there might be 30 or 32 teams in the nfl but each team gets an equal percentage of those deals and that way everyone can profit off of um, off of a team doing well so uh the that's how the National Football League tries to maximize revenues. But in baseball, um, each team is able to um, negotiate their own deals and uh, and ink sponsorship deals for their uh, for with their own intellectual property. So the deals for the New York Yankees are much more lucrative than, say, the deals for the Milwaukee uh, uh, Bruins, because. Milwaukee's a small market team and the Bruins, or the, I'm sorry, uh, Brewers. The Brewers uh, have um, less star power than the Yankees. So uh, these are different sort of uh, approaches to, uh, to uh, ownership governance and rules. Another rule uh, that is embedded in just about every professional sport league's bylaws is um, is territorial rights as well as um, ownership. So we'll talk about territorial rights uh, shortly, but in terms of sports franchises being granted uh, uh, right to uh, an individual's right to purchase and uh, purchase a professional sports team, um, most every team uh, is bound to the bylaws that say that permission is granted only under certain circumstances. So um, I believe that there's a high percentage uh, pursuant to the bylaws of the uh, of, of the National Football League that says about over 75 percent of the teams must uh, allow that uh, that individual to uh, to own the team. And uh, leagues are going to impose restrictions on ownership uh, in terms of whether or not you can own another team. While owning uh, the while owning uh, the team that you're seeking to buy within that league, uh, so there's also, as I mentioned, a corporate ban on uh, on franchise ownership, um, and the NFL up until very recently had a complete ban on people owning uh, more than one professional sports team. And and why do you think that was? Well, it really probably was that the NFL wanted team owners to have enough resources to invest in their foot in that football team and also have that football team be um, the most important interest to that league owner. As I mentioned before, territorial rights are also something that's granted as part of uh, being able to purchase a professional sports team. Um, usually uh, territorial rights are in about 75 to 100 miles in any direction of the city where that team is located, so there cannot be another prof another professional franchise in that league within 175 to 100 miles uh, within that uh, within that 
uh, realm. So um, this is something that's granted to um, uh, to uh, owners uh, of professional sports teams. Now, as you can see, uh, league franchise values have increased substantially over the last 20 years. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because of this notion of uh, franchise free agency. Um, teams uh, over the years have threatened to relocate from uh, their current city to another city uh, based off of uh, trying to leverage that other city into providing a better deal for that uh, for that uh, current uh, for the the team in the current market, and what that's led to uh, teams getting sweetheart deals with the current city that they're in. Maybe that city that doesn't want to lose the team will uh, provide financing uh, at a very reduced rate uh, or potentially free for creating a new stadium and allow that team to keep uh, the vast majority of the revenue. Or perhaps uh, that facility that is created will generate, will have that ability to generate much more uh, revenue through different uh, different uh, uh, approaches. Um, so uh, these are different aspects that help to generate uh, franchise values uh, in, in an increasing manner. Also, uh, broadcast deals uh, be, uh, between leagues and uh, leagues and broadcast uh, networks, as well as teams and broadcast networks, have increasingly. Uh, been inflated over the last 20 years, and this has led to increasing franchise values. Now let's talk about a couple of um, a couple of mechanisms that help with how a team is going to govern itself and the le how league governance works. Each league has its own commissioner, and the commissioner is someone who has uh, who acts as the face of the league and is. Uh, owes a duty to the best interests of the league. Uh, commissioners are generally hired by league owners, and they have this role of, um, among other things, approving player contracts, resolving dis uh, disputes between players and clubs or clubs and other clubs, and um, disciplining players as well as other league employees uh, who engage in conduct that's detrimental to the best interests to, of the league and other uh, decision making, uh, they've got other decision making role, uh, rule making authority. And the commissioner's post really owes its creation from uh, Judge uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was the first commissioner of professional sports. And Judge Landis uh, uh, arrived in the wake of the Chicago Black Sox scandal, which the textbook talks about. Over the years, there's been other uh, commissioners who have really um, elevated professional sport. Pete Rozell, um, who is uh, the commissioner of the National Football League uh, starting about 50 years ago or so, um, he really took the approach of what's best for the league is but what's best for each individual team. And so he really was responsible for establishing this culture of, of, of league think. And through Rozell's deft leadership, uh, he was able to uh, get all of the NFL franchises to uh, to um, uh, to assign their rights in the local broadcast contracts and assign them to the NFL, and then the NFL negotiated um, with different broadcast networks uh, for the to a to uh, for a contract that would uh, assign all of the broadcast rights of all the clubs to those networks, which then leverage the revenues uh, that the league would make and the teams would make. Um, over the years, um, especially with the National Football League, we've seen issues involving uh, commissioner uh, uh, commissioners uh, disciplining uh, players, uh, arguably uh, using inconsistent or arbitrary uh, approaches, and we've seen this from uh, Roger Goodell, and uh, th this has really become an issue with his personal conduct policy. But we've also seen more even-handed commissioners like uh, da uh, David Silver, uh, the commissioner of the NBA. So with the commissioner uh, and his authority, on the other hand, kind of is the 
uh, Players Association, and this is uh, Labor Relations. So uh, la uh, player uh, Labor Relations uh, started really uh, the, through unionism, and unionization started in about the 1885 uh, when John Montgomery Ward, who was a uh, Hall of Fame uh, baseball player and also a lawyer, tried to establish his the first players association to fight for uh, baseball players uh, who were professional athletes. And what he wanted to do was to uh, try to fight against the reserve system, which I had talked about, the reserve clause, and uh, also try to improve uh, players' lots in life through, uh, through uh, different mechanisms. But regrettably, he was rebuffed. Um, but in 1952, uh, Major League Baseball Players Association was created. And in 1954, uh, the National Basketball Players Association was created, and so on and so forth. And really, each of these entities were created to try to negotiate gains for the, the athletes uh, so that they would not be taken advantage of and to, to improve salaries. So as you can see on the slide, uh, the things that we know we um, that are commonplace within professional sports today, in terms of retirement, player pensions, uh, health care, uh, the for the ability to negotiate freely, um, all of these um, really uh, did not exist in the early 20th century. But labor relations began to play a major role in the 1960s when unionization. Um, was embraced by these different, uh, uh, by membership of these different professional sports leagues. And they really uh, embraced their, their right as, 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 um, as professional workers, as, as employees to unionize. And then once recognized as unions to collectively bargain with their respective leagues and then engage in strikes and lockouts in order to exert pressure on the uh, on the different leagues in order to win these gains that they were talking for, but this did not this came at a pretty steep price. Textbook talks about how, it, uh, especially with the prof with professional hockey and the NHL, that the owners publicly humiliated um, players who were active in trying to unionize, and this led to players being um, disciplined and and uh, retaliate against for um, for trying to unionize and some players' careers ending. Um, but in terms of the labor relations uh, or the labor management relationship uh, within professional sports, there's really five unique circumstances that, uh, that are the hallmark of professional sport. And it's how antitrust law interacts with professional sports specific to baseball's exemption, how collective bargaining works, how free agency works, salary caps in the draft. So we'll talk about that. So antitrust is really the law of competition. And it antitrust regulates any sort of anti-competitive business practice. How I said that the Dallas Cowboys and the New York Giants compete against each other on the field, but they can but they actually are partners uh, trying to grow the revenues of the game. Well that is a potential antitrust violation because we've got two competitors who are engaging in anti-competitive business practices by not competing against each other. Uh, off the field for revenues. So um, in order to have um, a successful sports league, things like bylaws, things like uh, contracts between the leagues, uh, at working together through the, through the draft, these are actually restrictive practices um, that violate antitrust law, arguably, but they're necessary for the stability of the league and for each team to have competitive balance. Then if the draft really helps to redistribute talent within the different sports leagues um, so that every team can be competitive. But the, the draft also makes it so it's not an open market and players coming from the college ranks aren't able to negotiate with ev all the teams at once. And that lack, going from being able to negotiate with about 30 teams to being able to negotiate with one team really restricts competition. And so that's where we have an antitrust violation because this lack of competition uh, may depress salaries uh, and keep people from uh, earning what they can in the open market. But um, under antitrust law, um, 
these, uh, uh, well, un actually, under the antitrust exemption, which is specific to baseball, um, baseball is not doesn't need to worry about violating the law of competition. And this this baseball's antitrust exemption really is an aberration that started when baseball's practices were being challenged in court in the uh, in the early 20th century, 1922. And because of the, the uh, seminal Supreme Court ruling of federal baseball versus National League, um, the, the ruling was that because um, baseball was professional baseball was conducted um, mostly in, 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 um, from in, in, in individual states, and you didn't have the crossing of state lines, and antitrust law is a federal law that really only applies to businesses that cross state lines, at the time of 1922, MLB was judged not to violate the antitrust law. But of course, today, Major League Baseball is a national and international enterprise, and if federal baseball is filed today, M MLB would certainly uh, be looked at as uh, engaging in interstate commerce and most likely violating antitrust. But ultimately, Major League Baseball was granted an antitrust exemption and is not is exempt. But um, it's to, um, due to the Kurt Flood Act, um, the uh, only parts of uh, Major League Baseball's practices are protected by antitrust exemption. And actually, all of Minor League Baseball is still protected under the MLB or under the uh, labor exemption. It should be mentioned that um, all the other professional leagues other than baseball are still uh, still. Um, um, they still still fall under the, uh, the purview of antitrust law, but when you have uh, when a union is duly recognized by a league and has a collective bargaining relationship between the league and the players, um, antitrust law is actually uh, is uh, is um, exempt or not, is um, antitrust law is really bumped in favor of labor law. Uh, there's an exemption, and because of this, uh, because antitrust is exempted in favor of labor law, because um, there is a policy among uh, the the courts that favor um, collective bargaining over court intervention through antitrust law, and so collective bargaining really is where uh, athletes work together as a union to meet and to find out what they want as a union and then negotiate with the league management uh, for under terms and conditions uh, of employment. And this is how we've seen uh, different sports uh, players association win gains for membership in, um, in uh, those pensions and free agency and workers' compensation, et cetera. And it's really through the process of collectively bargaining and then uh, threatening uh, a strike in the event that the, the, the league uh, does not work with them and does not give them what they want. So um, the collective bargaining is overseen through the National Labor Relations Act, which is a federal law that really encourages and sets out the, the policy of the United States that favors uh, the ability of workers to um, organize and unionize and then negotiate with their employer for each other's own mutual aid and protection. And it's this negotiation that's called uh, concerted activity. And so this is really how workers, not just in professional sports, but all uh, areas uh, win gains. And so the National Labor Relations Act gives us, gives workers three basic rights. The right to organize, which is the right to join a union, the right to collectively bargain uh, with the employer, and then the right to engage in concerted activities for employees' mutual aid and protection, basically the, to, to use labor law to protect yourself. And the ultimate goal of the National Labor Relations Act and collective bargaining is to come up with what's called a collective bargaining agreement. And a collective bargaining agreement is a big contract that is between the union and the league that lays out really the terms of how working um, working in that organization is going to work. So common elements are compensation for employees, their their rights uh, under that agreement, um, 
any sort of protection, any sort of benefits, and what happens uh, in disciplinary proceedings. And we don't, uh, the, what is in the CBA in a, on a detailed level is really kind of beyond the scope of this. So we'll say that for another day. Free agency is um, also common within labor relations because uh, every professional sports league now has defeated the, uh, the reserve clause through collective bargaining and through strikes and through uh, uh, overcoming intimidation from the, uh, the employer. So um, now uh, free agency really is the ability of a player to go from team to team to have that right to negotiate with any team that he or she wants. And usually what happens is that um, a player, when they're drafted or coming into the league, does not get immediate rights to um, uh, to free agency. But over time, they win that right to free agency. And so after fulfilling a certain, year, a certain number of years of service, players have that right to free agency. Um, and this really is an item that's negotiated as part of a collective bargaining agreement. And you might ask yourself, well, why would the why would the league let the union uh, or let the players have free agency? Well, the union and the players had to give up something in order to get that free agency. So it could be a concession in terms of um, um, a commissioner authority or maybe less money into a pension, et cetera. It could be virtually anything. And that's really how this works is both sides, when a negotiation for a CBA, both sides get something, but also both sides give something up. So it's kind of back and forth. And sort of the, um, the, 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 the corollary with uh, free agency is salary caps. And salary caps are uh, an, an item, um, um, a mechanism that's part of um, leagues where there's, it's a maximum on how much teams can spend on player salaries and it's supposed to encourage uh, um, parity. And so um, although there might be a few exemptions, this is really uh, usually where you have uh, free agency. Uh, there's usually a salary cap in some form. Every team or every league has a salary cap in some form. Even Major League Baseball has a soft cap in the luxury tax. So um, that really is uh, the basics on salary caps in terms of the elements and it's put in, in th through collective bargaining and um, caps also help uh, teams or force them to be pretty judicious about uh, their signings. So finally, we've got the player draft. Like I said, the draft is another way to ensure parity that would normally be a violation of antitrust law. So um, draft, the player draft is collectively bargained into the CBA. And uh, it's a way to restrict com uh, competition for, for new talent and also drive down player salaries. In terms of professional sports, it's also important to talk about how they make revenues. I said at the beginning, media contracts, sponsorships, and licensing are, are, are pretty, are, are pretty um, uh, fundamental uh, mechanisms. And one of the reasons why sports teams have increased so uh, greatly in uh, in value. So um, league uh, revenues are generated from uh, national and radio contracts, uh, licensing, sponsorship agreements, and then local ones are through local broadcasting, gate receipts, uh, seating arrangements, and other sort of local uh, sponsorship agreements. So we've really seen an increase in media contract value because of the capability of satellite, cable, new media, able to access new audiences internationally. And with this uh, has been an increasing global market. With the increasing global market, we've also seen um, the value of these contracts go up and increased choices are available because there's new television networks, which has led to increased sort of competition. We also see gate receipts um, as being one of, the, one of the main staples. And this is for minor league baseball, probably the most important revenue generation. Um, but um, for gate receipts, how it works usually is the vast majority of the revenues are retained by the home team, but a portion are given to the visiting, are, are given to the visiting team as well as the league. Um, but it's gonna differ by league. 
We also have uh, licensing and merchandise, and we talked about this in prior chapters, but this is where leagues and teams are going to grant the manufacturers the right to use the names and logos uh, in merchandising. And we also see in some leagues, like the NFL, where teams are going to assign their intellectual property rights to the league to negotiate the, the, the greatest deals for the teams that get the highest return on investment. And then some leagues and teams do allow it for individually. In terms of sponsorship, um, as the reach of these games increases internationally and we see new forms of broadcast media, we're also seeing sponsorship rights increase and in that the right to associate with a sport or a team or a league is becoming even more lucrative. So uh, sponsorship usually has common elements like signage or media uh, or naming rights, and these come in different forms. And they're probably only going to increase as uh, advertisers become more um, savvy, more creative. And then finally, we've got some issues. Um, the the um, the existence of the salary cap has remained a sticking point between labor and management, and this has led to strikes. Um, also, labor relations in general, historically speaking, um, the relationship between the players associations and the leagues is one that's frayed and contentious. But as leagues and teams realize that um, the uh, continued operation without interruption, without strike or lockout, is in the best interest financially of both player and the league. Um, we're seeing um, team, or, uh, players associations and leagues act more as partners than competitors, and this is working to benefit uh, both, both sides. Um, one thing that is not benefiting both sides is um, litigation and over... Um, Pl uh, players developing uh, medical uh, uh, conditions or repercussions as a result of uh, CTE, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which attacks the brain and is linked to uh, concussions. So violent sports like hockey and football are having to deal with litigation and the fallout of how players are going to be compensated uh, for uh, them being exposed to CTE. And this is really beyond the scope of our, our class, but it's something that you might want to check out. And finally, drug testing, which uh, we talked about uh, the WADA, WADA, and the USADA, the U.S. Anti-Doping uh, Association. Um, drugs uh, and keeping the game clean is always something that's important to leagues. We saw Major League Baseball um, in the late 90s um, as a way to come back and, and regain fans from their 1994 um, lockout uh, and cancel, cancel the season, a home run race between Sammy Sosa and Barry Bonds, or actually it was, no, Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds. Um, I'm sorry, geez. Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa. Barry Bonds was in 19, uh, was a little bit after that. But it turns out that many of these baseball, uh, these, these uh, sluggers um, were being fueled by performance dance and drugs, and that really cut against the credibility of these leagues. So um, drug testing and keeping the appearance of legitimacy and truth in these leagues is always at, uh, important to these leagues. In terms of some uh, other issues, uh, globalization is certainly important. Um, as, we, as technology increases uh, and brings more people uh, uh, into the fold to be able to view um, games in North America or in sports in North America. Um, we will see these professional sports leagues trying to capitalize on those revenues to bring them into the fold. So we see the National Football League uh, being focused internationally. Uh, they have they are holding regular season games in England each year. And NBA, NBA is focused really in emerging markets like China, India, and, and parts of South America, and even in Europe. So these are some, just a brief introduction to what's going on with professional sport. And as always, I'm happy to continue the discussion offline. Thank you.